both my wife and I are emergency medicine physicians, and so we talk a lot about this. We weren't prepared for this, and you can see that, um, you know, looking back at how this was handled initially. And so the ball was definitively dropped, and that cost lives. I don't have any doubt about that. But I think the fear here is that the other the other thing is people latched on this concept that only the elderly will be affected by this, or people with significant comorbidities like congestive heart failure, diabetes. And unfortunately, that's not the case. You know, there are people who are my age, I'm 39. There are people who are in their 20s who are presenting in acute hypoxic respiratory failure and needing to be intubated, needing to be ventilated, and who are dying. Um, teenagers have died. So un, un, luckily, this is not affecting pediatric population as much as it is, you know, uh, adults. And obviously, you have a higher risk of of dying with having diabetes, being 80, you know, having, you know, a poor heart or, or poor lung function. But there's no doubt that people my age who are completely healthy are ending up on ventilators and dying. And so being an emergency medicine physician and, you know, the job is, is, is resuscitating these patients. And, you know, not only and in recognizing how virulent this thing is, you know, it stays on surfaces for three days. It's easily it's easily aerosolized. You know, if we do chest compressions on a patient who has COVID-19 and codes, they can aerosolize all you do in chest compressions. If you put a nasal cannula in these patients, high flow nasal cannula, they can breathe out through their oral pharynx and aerosolize that way. So and, and, and as a provider, you're breathing that stuff in, you know, um, how many Italian physicians have died? You know, numbers are kind of all over the I don't have a definitive number there, but nurses are dying physicians are dying and so that's a that's a definitive fear of mine but um i i there's also i, I think a real sense of not wanting to sit this one out you know what i mean i think that physicians and and nurses in general that's that's why they went into this it's why i went into emergency medicine and i think that as scary as that is i'd rather you know help fight this thing than, than kind of sit back and and uh and sit at home and, and try and wait it out in that sense. Uh, obviously, some of us have to do that, and that's the responsible thing to do. But as a physician, um, you know, you got to show up and, and do your best. The other thing I would recommend that, that if America really wants to help the medical institutions is don't go to the ED unless you absolutely have to. I would, this is not the time to go to the ED because you think you, you sprained your ankle. Um, you are only creating a danger for yourself. I would only go, and if you have a cough and fever, I would stay at home, I would self-isolate, stay away from your other family members until that is completely resolved. When you want to go in is if you're short of breath, if you're having difficulty breathing, now it's time to go and be assessed. I've seen so many people complain that they can't get tested, which is unfortunate. It sucks that people can't get tested with a cough and a fever. It'd be nice to know who has this, you know, who's infectious, but right now we just don't have the tests, and so I would just, yeah. This is not the time to go into the ED unless you really are in trouble. You know, you think you're having a heart attack, you think you're having a stroke. Yeah, absolutely come into the emergency department. But I think if people can stay away from those institutions, if you just have a cough, if you just have a fever, I would stay at home. Um, because that the, even if we tested you and you're positive for COVID, the management is the same. Stay, just self-isolate at home. So whether you're positive with a test or you don't get a test, the management for those that patient population is exactly the same. Stay at home, isolate. You know, you're not going to get admitted for a cough and fever, even if you're COVID positive. So the patients who need to come in are the patients in respiratory distress. The homeless population is a, a, a population that is absolutely at a higher risk. They have comorbidities that are they're often unknown. Um, they can be diabetic without anybody. You know, they're not they're not taking medications often. Um, they're a population that, it, you know, they have nowhere. They, they, how do they isolate? How do they, how do they care for themselves? How do they get medications? How do they get treatments? How do they, how do they call for help? You know, uh, how do they get uh, the help that they need if they're in trouble? I think what they're doing in Vegas, uh, I don't know if you've seen this, but they've, they've basically marked off areas in a parking lot that are six feet by six feet for homeless people to basically come and lay there on the street. Uh, Wow. It's it's a it's a ridiculous concept. Um, first off, I think it just goes. I mean, you've got a bunch of empty hotels in Vegas right now. Why don't you put these people in hotels? And then I think the concept of putting up this invisible barrier that oh six by six just stay away from each other. Well, these are human beings. They're going to congregate. They're going to talk. You're literally putting all the homeless people together now, which I think is a much higher risk. Right? That's like putting people on a cruise ship right now. 
it's dangerous. So I, I don't know who came up with that. I think it's ludicrous. I think it's also an insult to their humanity, but they are absolutely a population who's at higher risk of getting this virus and then succumbing to it because they don't have access to care. There's been some lines drawn in the sand about, you know, some racial lines drawn in the sand, which is unfortunate. We've seen um, the abuse of Asian Americans uh, because of, you know, people have associated this virus with China, which is completely ridiculous, erroneous, and racist. Um, that doesn't help anybody. You know, this is no one's fault. This is a random occurrence of a virus that has taken the world by storm. And, and what's a, I think that's probably the saddest thing to see is the way people tend to fall apart over this they don't listen to you know scientists and the, these people who are still holding gatherings the kids who went to new jersey to celebrate spring break you know we have a pastor down in louisiana who's holding thousand person congregations uh in defiance of, of the governor of the state those all those people are putting all of us at risk um but but more more than anybody i think physicians and nurses who would have to take care of these patients if they get sick that's exactly how you end up overwhelming the system is, hey, let's not self-isolate. Let's not listen to what scientists are saying. You know, people have said this is a great equalizer, but I disagree. You know, yeah, we've seen some NBA players infected, and yeah, some some people who are uh, well-to-do have died, absolutely. But it's, it's, not a, it's, it's, not a, it's not, I wouldn't call it the great equalizer. I would say that it's, you still have people who are at much higher risk because of their socioeconomic status. And that's, that's medicine in general, right? I mean, poor people are going to die of things that they shouldn't die of because they don't have access to care. Um, and we, that's, that's nothing new. And so you'll see that with this. So my message to people would be, you know, stay at home, listen to the scientific community. Um, and I would, I would say to people, this is a good time to tell people who you love that you love them. Um, a lot more people are going to die from this. So this is the time to make that phone call, um, or to reach out to somebody, you know, to put a fight aside in a family, a family feud or something. This is a time to reach out and say, Hey, I care about you and I love you because you may not have the opportunity.